This is the human side of healthcare, where we explore all aspects of today's ever-changing healthcare environment. Brought to you by the Dallas-Fort Worth Hospital Council and featuring CEO Stephen Love with co-host Thomas Miller. Now, let's make healthcare human again. Welcome to the human side of healthcare. We're delighted that you're here this Sunday. We're in the middle of July. It's pretty hot. And Thomas, uh, I guess we've kind of determined that the heat doesn't uh, do a lot of control of COVID-19. Yeah, when we were in March, and still, if you can even imagine the concept of this, wearing jackets (laughs) in Dallas, that we were thinking, well, maybe this might tap down a little bit in the summer. Uh, Yeah, no. Yeah, it really hasn't. And, you know, Texas is still one of the hot spots throughout the nation. And if you look at South Texas and even San Antonio, you know, they've had a tough week. And we're real busy here in the hospitals in North Texas. But thankfully, at this point, at least at this point, we're hanging in there. We're pretty steady. But you know, Thomas, we're still waiting to see what's going to be the after effect of July 4th. Yeah, and we're right on that crossroads. One of the things that has been the message that's been going out is please wear a mask. And of course, Governor Abbott very wisely put a, a statewide mask order into effect. And now we're starting to see a lot more evidence and science behind the fact that a mask can really help resolve and tap this thing out. So why not, Steve, that we do a show on that? (laughs) What a great springboard. I think that's a great idea. And, you know, you're right. The evidence is there that wearing a mask is so effective. You know, and you mentioned some of the uh, executive orders from Governor Abbott You know, if you remember, a couple of weeks ago, he closed down bars, and he also said we should wear a mask. I think those two items right there, Thomas, have made a tremendous difference. And I'm really hoping that because of July 4th and movement of people, if they weren't going to bars and they were wearing masks, maybe it's going to have a positive impact in slowing community spread. Well, and you know, one of the big things that people are starting to think about now is going back to school. Parents are starting to wonder, what's that going to be like? And this is going to be the topic that we're going to discuss in our next two segments coming up from one of the infectious disease specialists and professors at UT Southwestern Medical School. You're right. And you know, Thomas, I'm going to add another reason. You know, this is the human side of healthcare. And let me just tell you, the real human side of healthcare of those heroic first responders and people in our hospitals that are treating COVID-19 patients. If for any other reason, wear a mask to protect them. Because you see, if you wear a mask and you slow the community spread, then it's going to make fewer people have to go to the hospital. And our hospital workers have been at this for four months. They're putting their blood, sweat, and tears into treating the people of North Texas. So wear a mask so that you don't go to the hospital or your neighbor doesn't go to the hospital, a family member doesn't go to the hospital, and our hospital workers get a break. Yeah, it kind of goes without saying that, obviously, the folks who are taking care of people in the local hospitals and hospitals around the world are moms and dads and aunts and uncles and grandmas and grandpas themselves. Seems to me, Steve, that really when we think about wearing a mask and we're being asked to do something that we normally don't do and we're in one sense being told to do something, that when we start to think beyond ourselves and we really start to think of others, what can we do to make this work for everybody, we're all in this together, that putting the mask on will help our state and our country get back to normal. You know, you can say, how do you stimulate the economy? You wear a mask. How do you get schools back? You wear a mask. How do you protect the teachers and the students? You wear a mask. How do you slow the community spread? You wear a mask. You know, it's three words that answer the biggest thing that individuals can do, Thomas. Wear a mask. Again, this is drawing itself along political lines because we saw this week a governor actually enacted a no-mask ordinance. 
you know, from your perspective, from the hospital's perspective, what does that say? Well, you know, Thomas, as I've said before, this is not a political show, and hospitals treat Democrats and Republicans. So let me just say, I'm not going to touch on the political aspect of this, but let me touch on the public health aspect and on the medical aspect. And in talking to experts like epidemiologists, infectious disease docs, the science is there. The evidence is there. Wash your hands for at least 20 seconds. Practice good physical distancing. Practice good personal hygiene. And yes, wear a mask. You know, it's hard to argue evidence. And I've said, and we've said, all the way back to when it first came out about expanding Medicaid. Hospitals didn't get into politics. Hospitals said, we want to expand coverage. We want to help people so that they can get the appropriate health care they need. And we said at that time, public health policy should not be political policy. I will tell you now, as far as how we treat COVID-19, let's go with the science. Let's go with the public health experts. Political policy should never be public health policy. Well, what a perfect segue to our first guest coming up right after this break. That is Dr. Robert Haley. He's professor of internal medicine and the director of the Division of Epidemiology in the Internal Medicine Department at UT Southwestern Medical Center. He spent 10 years, Thomas, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I didn't know if you knew that. I did not know that. And he is one sharp professor. (laughs) And he has followed these major diseases, these major pandemics that we've had, including SARS and Ebola and now COVID, and has the science that you were just talking about. Absolutely. And he's a great guy, full of knowledge, great nuggets of information. Our listeners are in for a real treat. Now, to validate what Steve was just saying, One of the things you're going to hear from Dr. Haley is new information that has been studied and determined where even just wearing covering over your face makes a huge difference in not only your susceptibility to getting the virus, but also the severity of the virus that you might get, you might have if you get it. So this is very important, new, relevant information that we're going to cover the whole mask How can we work together cooperatively to tap this virus down in North Texas? And that will stop the community spread, as you say, Thomas, and it's going to really help us get back to the new normal and almost back to the way we were pre-COVID. And, Steve, you could sleep better at night and not have to work so hard during the day. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, you know what? No matter what we do, I salute those healthcare workers and the hospitals. They are the people that are putting in the long hours, and we owe them a tremendous amount of not only respect, but gratitude. Some cutting-edge COVID information from UT Southwestern and Dr. Robert Haley coming up next on the Human Side of Healthcare. This is the Human Side of Healthcare on 1080 KRLD and the Radio.com app, where we feature healthcare's hottest topics and what our North Texas area hospitals are doing to make healthcare human again. And welcome to the Human Side of Healthcare. We're going to continue our discussion related to COVID-19, and we're delighted to have a distinguished teaching professor with us today. We have Dr. Robert Haley, who's the professor of internal medicine, director of the Division of Epidemiology in the Internal Medicine Department at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Dr. Haley, thank you for joining us today. Sure, happy to be here. You know, as we look at COVID-19, and it's been a lot of information out there, we know that we should, one, wear a mask, two, practice good physical distancing, three, wash our hands, and of course, practice good personal hygiene. If you had to pick the most important of those, could you do that? Hands down, it's masking. 
masking is emerging over the last several months as I believe the key to controlling this thing. So masking. So let me ask you this. What type of mask do you recommend? Again, this has evolved, too, over the last few months as we've learned a lot more about it, had a lot of experience uh, all over the world with this, and a lot of good science has been done about it. At first, we thought you needed a medical-grade mask, but it turns out you don't. Uh, Pretty much any mask that fits over your mouth and nose protects not only the mask wearer, but also the people around them from this disease. Because the disease is spread almost entirely by speaking. If you're not speaking, you're not transmitting it. Okay? So when you speak or yell or sing, you produce particles or droplets that come out of your mouth, uh, spray in the area that you're looking. And if somebody else breathes those in deep down into their lungs, they are likely to get a very bad case of COVID-19. A mask in front of your mouth and nose, uh, when you speak or cough or sneeze, the mask catches those little droplets because they're wet. And so they, they impact on the inside of the mask and they're stopped. Now, it's true that maybe a few get through but this is a numbers game. The more virus you inhale, the sicker you're likely to get. Okay, so if, you, if your mask contains 80% of those droplets, uh, people around you are fine. Okay, so if, if you're in a room with other people and everybody is masked, it's my view, and I think the view of many, that you're all safe. If somebody's not wearing a mask and they happen to be carrying the virus, then everybody is at risk. But if you're wearing a mask, it probably cuts your risk down. Our current estimates are about 70% uh, less likely to get infected. And if you're wearing a mask and you do get infected, you're more likely to have a mild case of it than if you don't have a mask and you just inhale all those particles uh, deep into your lungs. That's where you're going to get a really bad case. So if everybody's masked, I think we're in good shape. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the governor finally uh, enacted a uh, passed an order ordering everybody to mask when they're uh, in contact with other people unless you can distance uh, appropriately. And we really are hoping that uh, and, and counting on the fact that that masking order is going to end the current resurgence that we're having, this huge epidemic that we're having right now, that mask order by itself may reduce it. Uh, In fact, we're already seeing that it is plateauing, and we're hoping in the next week or two, you know, it takes two or three weeks for any kind of change to be, the effects of that to be seen because the incubation period of the disease is up to two weeks. And so the sins we commit today, we're going to be paying for, for for the next two weeks before anything can change. Right. That's great advice. A good friend of mine who's a nurse was actually in the grocery store the other day, and she saw a lady standing there that did not have a mask on. And she went up to the lady and was not confrontational in any way and just said, why aren't you wearing a mask? And she said, well, I feel good today. I don't feel bad, so I don't need to wear a mask. And she said, but you could be asymptomatic. And the lady looked at her and said, very honestly, what is asymptomatic? So I think sometimes we need to explain to people, you know, even if you aren't running a fever and you feel good, you still need to wear a mask. Yes, that's that's absolutely true. Of course, asymptomatic means that you you don't have symptoms of COVID. But what we know now that we actually didn't know uh, three months ago is that probably half of all the infections that are transmitted are transmitted from people who don't feel sick, who have no clue that they're ill, but they are infected. They have the virus in their throat. And when they talk, it spews out, uh, even though they have no sickness. Now, some of those people will be what we call pre-symptomatic. That is, they're about to get sick because for the 
two to three days before you develop your first symptom, the virus is growing up into your in your throat and you're transmitting it. But then it's equally true that uh, many people, many people, maybe almost half of people who get infected will be infected and never get symptoms. So these are the truly asymptomatic who will never get symptoms, but yet they have the virus in their throat, and when they talk or laugh or sing, uh, they will transmit it to those around them. And that's why the recommendation is, and now the, the order from the governor is, that everyone should mask, whether you feel good or not, because we know most of, uh, half the cases are being transmitted by people who don't know they're ill. Right. Let me pivot just a minute, if I could, Dr. Haley. And, I, and I'll be the first to admit, I'm just going to tell you up front, I'm an old guy, and when I was a young person, you know, in my 20s, I was pretty hard-headed, so I'll say that. But we're hearing about these COVID-19 parties where people are going to, and a young man in San Antonio actually contracted COVID-19 and died as a result of that. What are your thoughts on these COVID-19 parties? I've seen two reports of this. One is the 30-year-old man in San Antonio who died in the hospital, and before he di- just before he died, he confessed to his nurse that said, I think I made a mistake. I thought this was a hoax, but it's not. <laughs> uh, very sad case. And supposedly he went to a COVID party where the the person who held the party invited their friends to see if to, to prove that it was a hoax, and uh, this fellow got sick and died. Uh, actually, uh, that's probably a true story, although uh, it's not been con- corroborated by externally. But uh, the nurse felt that man was telling the truth anyway. The the other s- story I've heard is that uh, this is actually a report it may have some credibility credibility that the University of Alabama football team was having COVID parties where they would get together with somebody who had it with the idea that they would all get sick now, get over it, and then they could win the national championship because all the other teams, their members were out sick. Uh, again, there's no real confirmation of that, but University of Alabama officials apparently did warn them and all the students uh, not to do this. Now, those are the only two stories I've heard. Neither one has been really corroborated. And it's not clear that this is really happening, uh, at at least not happening widely, because nobody's really seeing it. But what's really problem is not the purposeful COVID parties. It's all the little social gatherings, the family weekend gatherings. Just get anytime people get together, young people, young adults going to bars, uh, having a fine time in these crowded bars with nobody wearing a mask and having a fine time talking, yelling, laughing, singing. That's where we're seeing the majority of spread right now is these social events that are not purposeful. In fact, the people believe there's nothing wrong with it. But in the last month, we've had this huge increase, 10,000, 11,000, 12,000 cases a day in Texas, and an increase in mortality. That's almost entirely driven by young people who got the idea about a month ago, actually memorialed over the Memorial Day holiday, we were opening up the state and they thought, well, since we're opening up, we're going to go get together with our friends now and have a great time, and they, they're still doing it. And this is what's driving this big epidemic right now. You're listening to Dr. Robert Haley, who is Professor of Internal Medicine and Director of the Division of Epidemiology at the Internal Medicine Department of UT Southwestern here in Dallas-Fort Worth. Quick break here, and when we come back, one of the pressing issues that families are dealing with in North Texas right now is what is back to school going to look like? Dr. Haley has some thoughts and advice. You're listening to The Human Side of Healthcare, brought to you by the Dallas-Fort Worth Hospital Council. And we have a podcast. It's on all the major podcast players. Just search up The Human Side of Healthcare. And more with Dr. Robert Haley, coming up next. The DFW Hospital Council, along with our over 90 member hospitals in North Texas, are proud to bring you the human side of healthcare with Council President and CEO Stephen Love and co-host Thomas Miller. 
masking is easy. If you wear a mask and everyone else wears a mask, we can all leave our homes, go shopping, go to school, go to university, go to work, and this thing will disappear. And that is the truth. But you worry about the economy, and you look around and you see somebody not wearing a mask. That's the person that's preventing us from opening the economy. That is Dr. Robert Haley. He's professor of internal medicine and director of the Division of Epidemiology at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. We're continuing our conversation with him, and one of the biggest issues facing North Texas families right now is what school is going to look like. From his perspective of studying and teaching about diseases at one of the premier medical schools in the country, let's see what Dr. Haley has to say about this upcoming school year. Yes, I've got a lot of thoughts, but I have to say nobody has the magic answer, okay? This is a a really difficult puzzle, but I am for opening schools because I think I agree with the American Academy of Pediatrics that recently came out with a very strong statement that we should be sending kids back to school. Their reasoning is that the harm that children sustain from not going to school outweighs the harm that they might experience and their families might experience if we send them to school. In other words, they're saying, yes, it's not totally safe to send them to school, On the other hand, the harm of not sending them to school is far worse. That is, falling behind academically. Uh, You know, schools not only provide academic advancement, but it's also, it's a socialization experience. For many kids who who don't have, who are in low-income families, it's their nutrition, also exercise. So there are many things that schools do for kids that are important for our uh, society. And on the other side of the equation, the risk to children certainly is extremely small. Now, this this is what people don't realize. And and the reason this is not understood, let, let let me give you some background. You know, for decades now, we've realized that influenza is dramatically spread by children. In fact, out in the community, a flu epidemic, a, a fatal flu epidemic that might kill 40,000 people in the country a year, th- those epidemics are driven by children in school. And they've actually shown in studies that when you vaccinate all the children in a community, you reduce the rate of death of the elderly people from flu. So children spread flu. This is not the same disease. COVID-19 is not spread importantly by children. In fact, there's a dramatic relationship between the likelihood of getting infected or transmitting the disease with age. That is from 12 down to age 12 down, you see very few infections and in school experiences where where they found an outbreak of uh, COVID illness, particularly among teachers, they find that that is not coming from the children. It's coming from one teacher to another. That's some studies in school districts where they've, they've epidemiologically studied these things. So infections in school are much more likely to be traded around by the, by the faculty and the staff than from children to the faculty. And it's more likely to be transmitted from the faculty and staff to children, but not the other way. Now, why is that? Well, let me let me go a little bit into the to the molecular uh, biology of this, and I'll try to make this uh, understandable to everybody because we need to understand this. It's important for this school question. The virus, the virus that causes COVID-19 illness, it has to enter the cells in your lung to make you sick. And the way it does that, it gets down in your lung, and when it comes to a human lung cell, there is a little, what's called a receptor on the surface of that lung cell. It's called an ACE2, A-C-E-2 receptor. It's just a little molecule on the surface. Well, that's where the virus hooks to it, and once it hooks to that ACE2 receptor, it can then penetrate into the cell and make that cell sick produce more virus inside the cell, which is released, and then goes and infects more cells. That's how it gets you, okay? Well, it turns out that ACE2 receptors increase with age. 
the older you get, the more of those ACE2 receptors you have, and that we think that's one of the main reasons that we see most of the deaths in people, elderly people, and people in nursing homes, grandparents, whereas young middle-aged people can die from it, but it's less common. And in children, we almost never see a death or even a severe illness because children below 18 really have fewer and fewer as they get younger, I mean, as they are younger, fewer of these ACE2 receptors. And so they're just not susceptible to the disease the way you are when you're older. Now, it is true that when there's a little epidemic going on, children can become infected and have virus in their throat. But for reasons that we don't understand, we don't see a lot of infection that way from those children. One example, uh, in Denmark and the Netherlands, both, this has been well studied. And in those cases, the infection rate in the community was declining. And so they opened the schools and the rate of disease continued declining. Opening the schools in that circumstance did not cause the epidemic to surge forward as it would with a, an influenza outbreak. That would be a fatal thing to do. You would turn the epidemic back around and, and open it back up again, but not with COVID-19. So there is reason to believe, although let me say none of this is proven to the extent that we would like, but the evidence that we have right now is that children are not the problem. If children are infected, it's almost certainly came most likely from their homes or uh, from being out in public with our other adults or from the faculty and the staff. Now, the faculty and staff can control that because if they're all wearing masks, uh, then they're not going to spread it among themselves. And if they do, it will be a light infection. They probably won't even notice. But as long as they're wearing a mask, uh, that will not be a problem. So I think that's... To me, that is the most important consideration. Now, what about safety measures? How do we keep children safe and the, and the teachers safe? And I, and I think there is rightly more concern for the teachers than there are for the children. We're not going to have children dying of this thing, but if we're not careful and, we're, and we don't do this right, we can infect teachers, and uh, that would be a calamity. Okay, so what can you do to make this safer in schools? Number one, number one is we can reduce the rate of disease in the community. So if we have done our job, everybody's wearing a mask out there following the governor's order, this disease is going to turn around, and it's, by early September, this thing will be down to a much smaller rate, and then everybody is safer in school or out of school. That is number one thing we've got to do. In fact, I very strongly agree with the school superintendents and state officials and others who believe we should put off the opening of school. You know, we just, within the last two weeks, have the governor's order, so we haven't seen a great reversal. But as I mentioned, we have seen a leveling off to some degree. So I suspect we're going to see it turning around on the other hand, in the next week or two, we may need a stay-at-home order to really force it down so that by early September, uh, it's, it's going away. That's number one. Number two is we need to mask in school. Okay, certainly the faculty and staff need to mask because the, the adults are where the risk comes from, so they must mask. But we also need to have the children mask. We need to have children masks, particularly if there's a lot of disease out in the community. As we get that community disease under control, we can relax the student masking while we continue the faculty and staff masking. Now, some people say, oh, well, children can't wear a mask. That is wrong. I've got grandchildren, and they can wear a mask. Children can do whatever you expect them to do, pretty much. Kids can learn to mask. Now, the older they are, the more vital it is to mask, and the more likely they can do it. Now, there have to be some exceptions. There are children who uh, just can't wear a mask. There are adults who can't wear a mask. People who have active asthma, for example, uh, makes them very, very uncomfortable to wear a mask. And there, there are certain other conditions. And those children, it's not clear what to do. One way to do is to have them do uh, distance learning, you know, by, by the Internet. In addition to 
contain, containing the epidemic in the community, number one, and masking, number two. Then we have hand washing, and that's, of course, is going to take some effort, but that's easy to do. It can be done. You can have hand cleanser, you know, alcohol-based hand cleanser in every classroom, and teachers can remind kids and, and so forth, and they can go to the restroom and wash their hands and, and so forth, and they will do that. Now, the third one is, or the, the fourth one is distancing, and that has been generalized from recommendations for adults. For children, again, the risk of their transmitting it to each other is low to begin with, and if they're masked, I'm not sure that distancing is as important in that context as it is for adults. But I think if we have to compromise anywhere, I would say compromise on distancing. Now, it would be helpful, I think, a useful idea to reduce the number of kids in a classroom. But if that means having kids go only half the time, I don't think that's worth it. I think, uh, three feet of distance. In fact, I think the American Academy of Pediatrics says three feet is probably sufficient, and I think that's probably right. But I think that's the least important of these things. Masking is the key. Of course, outdoors is safer than indoors, so if you can have a class outdoors, that'd be great. Certainly outdoor play is a good idea. Uh, so I think, I think those are the, the key. Thank you so much, Dr. Haley, for sharing your thoughts with us here on the human side of healthcare. We'll be hearing from him again in the future. Now, continuing this school theme, your kids will have access to telemedicine for behavioral health this fall at school. We'll tell you about it coming up next on the human side of healthcare. We're continuing our conversation on how you can empower yourself to have the best health possible in today's ever-changing healthcare environment. This is The Human Side of Healthcare with DFW Hospital Council President and CEO Stephen Love and co-host Thomas Miller. Welcome to The Human Side of Healthcare. We're delighted that you're with us today. And we're going to continue a discussion uh, that we've had previously about mental health in Texas, especially among our young people. We're delighted that we've got Jason Isom with us. He's the Director of Integrated Behavioral Health at Children's Health, located here in Dallas. Jason, welcome again to our show. Thank you, Steve. It's my pleasure to be here. You know, we've talked previously with you about programs that you've initiated, you've given us updates, but I want to talk to you a little bit today about the Texas Child Health Access Through Telemedicine program. We would love to learn more about that. Can you explain to our listeners, one, what that is, and two, how it interacts with the people and the patients you serve? Absolutely. And again, thank you, Steve, for this opportunity. Um, the Texas Child Health Access Through Telemedicine, also known as TCHAT, it is a program that has been developed to expand or uh, begin telehealth programs to improve access to behavioral health services for children and youth through our schools. So at Children's Health, our version of the TCHAT program is called the School-Based Telebehavioral Health Program. But officially, we launched TCHAT in February of 2020. TCHAT really came out of the last legislative session in Senate Bill 11. And so that funding was authorized, and we were able to expand our services beginning in February 2020. Um, although at Children's Health, we've been providing school-based telebehavioral health services since the fall of 2017. Through TCHAT, we serve a nine-county area. Um, it is Dallas and Collin and uh, Denton counties, as well as Grayson, Fannin, and Hunt counties to the north, and Rockwall, Kaufman, and Ellis counties to the south. But it's important to know that the whole state of Texas is covered through TCHAT. Um, the state has been divided up through uh, regions, so our neighbors to the west and probably part of your audience are served by the University of North Texas, and our neighbors to the east are served by the University of the Texas at Tyler. Uh, here in North Texas, our hub is powered by uh, UT Southwestern and our partnership at Children's with them. Uh, one of the things I'm excited to tell you about is that our goal for TCHAT was to have a total of 110 new campuses served by our program by the spring of 2021. Well, at present, Steve, we are scheduled to have uh, TCHAT at 114 new campuses this fall already. 
and we'll be serving more than 160 campuses across 19 public ISDs and two private schools uh, in total in our school-based telebehavioral health program, which includes Teach Addict Children's. Uh, we're also pleased to announce that we'll, for the first time, serve 15 Dallas ISD schools this fall as part of our Teach Addict expansion. It's also noteworthy to note that during this pandemic, uh, we immediately pivoted to a fully virtual solution. So historically, we provide behavioral health care virtually to students while they're at school. But during the pandemic, we were able to uh, pivot our services and provide services to children and families while they were learning at home. And so there was no disruption to service uh, even throughout the pandemic. So let me uh, drill down just a little bit. To understand, when this is at some of these campuses that you mentioned, do you deal directly with students? Do you deal with a counselor at the school? Can you elaborate a little bit on the program? Certainly. So when a school uh, administrator or a teacher or a coach identifies a student with a potential behavioral health need, uh, they will contact their school counselor, and then that counselor will make a referral to the TTAP program. From there, a licensed master's level clinician, a licensed professional counselor, marriage and family therapist, or a clinical social worker will contact the family and assess the child and the family and their behavioral health needs. They will make a comprehensive individualized care plan, uh, which may include referrals and case management services, as well as virtual uh, behavioral health consultations, either provided at, at the school or uh, potentially at home as well. And we also have, for the first time available, direct to student and direct to family psychiatric consultation services available through TCHAT. So UT Southwestern has provided a psychiatrist and they will do a consultation with a student and a family virtually and they will help uh, diagnose complex diagnostic issues as well as determine the need for further psychiatric uh, evaluation and services beyond uh, TCHAT as well. You know, Jason, that is remarkable because I was thinking, uh, as you said, you may provide these services at the school or potentially at home. And it's good that you offer it at the school because when you look at some of the social drivers of health, some of these children may not have access to Wi-Fi at home or may not have access to what they need while you can help them at school. Am I right on that assumption? Absolutely. And so the, the whole point of CCHAT is to expand access and we want to remove barriers. And so that's one of the reasons why we provide it virtually um, and we provide it at school so they don't have to leave campus. Mom and dad don't have to get off work to take them to an appointment. They can get their behavioral health care right there while they're at school. And then if they elect to do a virtual learning environment this fall, uh, we can also provide services while they're at home too. So let me ask you this, Jason. I was just thinking of this, and I'm kind of putting you on the spot, so forgive me for that. But when COVID-19 came to town and uh, schools were closed and students were at home, for the children or the students that you were helping at school who no longer had access to the school, what happened if they don't have Wi-Fi at home? Was there any type of work around or anything you did to help those students? Yeah, so working with our school partners, Steve, many of them provided uh, devices for the students so they could continue learning. And those same devices made it capable for students to be able to access our services. Additionally, um, there were some students who, uh, rather than coming to school, the parents would drive to the, the school site and be in the parking lot and they could connect to the district's Wi-Fi there. And so there are a variety of means uh, that were provided for students during the pandemic so that they could continue to access our services. You know, I think it's just another great example how, uh, I guess, one of the silver linings, if we want to look for it, of COVID-19 is virtual health, telehealth, telemedicine, all came to the forefront during this COVID-19 pandemic. And we've learned a lot of lessons. Do you think you've garnered any nuggets of knowledge that you're going to use in the future that maybe you wouldn't have? had you not had to improvise with COVID-19. 
Yeah, one really specific example of that is we uh, went to a fully virtual online consent process. And so we removed the need to have paper, the fax paper consent forms back and forth. Uh, we're doing that completely online at this point. And so that was just one example that drove that the pandemic drove us to uh, utilize technology that we had, but that we hadn't utilized yet uh, to make it easier and, and give parents more access and children more access to our services. You know, if parents are interested in T-Chat, what should they do? Uh, they can do a couple of things. The first thing is to ask their school counselor and administrator if they are a part of T-Chat. Um, they can also go to www.childrens.com backslash telebehavioral, and there they can watch a short video about the program and learn more about uh, what we do and also where we are as well. So with the number of school districts you've already mentioned, how many students are currently in this program? Well, right now there are over 60,000 students that have access to the program at the end of the spring semester here. There are one, over a million children in our nine-county area uh, that we're trying to reach. So you said 60,000 people in, around the area are, have access to this program. Do you have any stories that have come out of this where lives have been changed and touched? Uh, very early on in the program, there was a student that was really struggling relating to peers and to their teachers. And as a result of the counseling that they received through this program, they were able to better relate to their peers. They're really their, the counselors related that their whole demeanor changed. And so we are seeing direct impacts on student lives. We actually measure that to some degree. And what we're seeing is about a 30% improvement in clinical symptoms uh, in just a few short, short sessions uh, with our team. Thank you, Jason, for information on Texas T-Chat. And that's T-C-H-A-T-T. Two T's on the chat if you'd like to look that up online. We'll be back next week with more on the human side of healthcare. Stay safe and wear that mask.